There's a crisis in the federal courts. What is it and what does it mean for criminal prosecutions and civil litigation? We'll ask Lawrence O'Neill, Chief U.S. District Judge, McGregor Scott, U.S. Attorney, Richard Waters from Miles Sears and Yanni, and Daniel Jamison from Dowling Aaron. Additional funding for the Maddie Report made possible by a grant from The Wonderful Company, harvesting health and happiness around the world. From the California Channel at the State Capitol and the Maddie Institute, it's the Maddie Report with Executive Director of the Maddie Institute, Mark Kepler. Welcome. So can you have justice without judges? That may be more than a rhetorical question. Our guest, for example, Lawrence O'Neill, the Chief U.S. District Judge for the Eastern District of California, has expressed deep concerns about what there is, seems to be a dwindling number of federal judges and what they may mean for justice for many Californians. Welcome to the Maddie Report. Thank you for having me here. So before we discuss the judicial crisis being faced by the federal district court, uh, can you briefly describe the federal court system? Our audience may not know all the ins and outs. What can you tell us about it? You know, the federal court system is one of limited jurisdiction, which simply means that unless it has to do with the United States Constitution or a, an act of Congress, we have no jurisdiction, no power to act. That's the difference between the Superior Court, which is a county state uh, court, and the federal court. Mm, federal court system. And so, of course, there's the district court, the trial court, which, which you're responsible for. Then there's a court of appeals and, of course, the Supreme Court. Yes, and what we call the district court, circuit court, United States Supreme Court. Okay. Um, circuit Court, Court of Appeals, so, uh, that right, kind of works together. Thing. Okay. Okay. So, so you're the senior judge of the Eastern District for California. What's the size of, of the Eastern District? In, in ge geography and population? Well, we uh, in encompass 55 percent of the state of California, and it goes from the center of the state east and from the Los Angeles border to the Oregon border. It's, it's a huge district. We have more than 8.2 million people in the district, so it is a very large district, not only population-wise, but also uh, geographically. Yeah, and I think you, you, you sent out a note uh, talking about this issue, and one of the things I note, noted in your note was that in terms of population, the Eastern District is larger than 38 states. Um, that's you know, a majority, and then when it comes to, to geographic size, it's larger than 41 states. That's right. Um, that's, a, that's a large district. Well, um, that's why when we go back east, we talk about it, and the district judges there can hardly believe that my statements are accurate. Yeah, they're pretty huge. But you're, you're, so you're the chief judge. I am. What are the responsibilities of a chief a judge for the uh, U.S. District Court? Well, in addition to having a full caseload that every district judge has, I have all the administrative duties of the uh, Eastern District. We have 28 federal judges within the Eastern District that include district judges, magistrate judges, senior district judges, and bankruptcy judges. So it deals, my, my uh, job deals with economics, uh, the budget, uh, any personnel issues, uh, basically the administration of the court. Can you just briefly describe this, a senior judge versus a magistrate judge? What's the difference? A senior judge, a senior judge is a district judge who has gotten enough hours and uh, enough years and enough age to uh, retire, but they work for free. Wow, that, that's a commitment. Um, and a magistrate? Magistrate judge is appointed by the district judges. District judges are nominated by the president and confirmed by the entire United States Senate, and they're appointed for life. Uh, magistrate judges are appointed uh, by the district judges uh, for six-year terms, and they can, of course, be renewed. That's amazing that senior judges are doing this for free. I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing. And you said there are about 28 or so judges total in the Eastern District? Total, total. including total. bankruptcy judges. So if you do the math, and I did the quick math on this before we started the program, that's about one judge for every 300,000 people. Well, it's worse than that because okay. there are only six judges, district judges, in the entire district. And uh, magistrate judges can, don't have the same powers that district judges have, especially in the criminal realm. So you have to start dividing by six instead okay, of by 28. Okay, now you've got half a million people. Um, uh, one judge for every half, uh, half a million, 500,000 people. That's one judge for the city of Fresno, essentially. That, that's uh, a lot to cover. So you're saying um, that the caseload is, is increasing um, for, each, for each judge, obviously because there's so few judges. Um, how much has it changed over time? How does it compare to the caseload for other district court judges nationally? The last district judge, new district judge we had, additional one, was in 1978. And the population was 2.5 million people. Now I've just indicated that the population is more than 8.2 million it's now. more than tripled. And we still have six district judges. We are dealing with, each district judge has approximately 900 cases each. 
the average in the entire nation. When we say nation, 900 cases, at any one time? Or every, at, all, at all the time, because some are coming in, some are being resolved. But generally, the, wow. uh, pop, the amount is approximately 900. And how does that compare nationally? The average per district judge nationally is 435. So twice as much? More than twice as much. That, that's amazing. Well, you know what they say, that justice delayed is justice denied. And as uh, the cases mount and judges retire, uh, the federal court is increasingly backlogged. How do we get to this point? That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. I'm Mark Hepper with the Maddie Institute. We're talking with senior judge for the U.S. District Court, Lawrence O'Neill, about the growing crisis in the Eastern District of California, an exploding caseload, and a dwindling number of judges that can actually hear those cases. Now, it's getting to the point where we may have to rethink the saying, you shouldn't make a federal case out of everything, to you won't be able to make a federal case out of anything. Um, so the last uh, district court judgeship you mentioned was in 1978. How has the district changed uh, since that time? Well, it's, uh, it's gone from 2.5 million people to more than 8.2 million people. Uh, the complexities of the cases have, uh, have exploded. Uh, the water law has uh, become more and more complex by the minute. That is an incredibly complex area of law. In fact, the first, first issue I ever got as a lawyer was on riparian rights, and I had to go look up, what are they talking, what's a riparian? <laughs> yes, yeah, they are very, very extensive cases, and uh, I am a, a pretty concise judge when it comes to writing opinions. Mm -hmm. My least, my, the, the smallest number of pages that I've, I've had in a water case is 76 wow. in an order. They're very complex. And you're dealing with, let's multiply that by 900 cases you're dealing with, not all of those are water, of course, but you don't need very many water cases to keep you very busy. Oh, that's true, and of course, that, we're not, we haven't even touched on criminal cases. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me ask you this. So this issue with the lack of district court judges, is that a common problem in other district courts, or is this unique to the Eastern District? Uh, in between. Uh, there are some other uh, districts in the United States who have what we call emergency needs, but there are, most of them are doing just fine, and they do not have uh, the problems that we have, thus the average uh, per district judge of 435 it, it, cases. It's much less. Um, so, you know, apparently 10 years ago, the administrative office of the courts, kind of the administrative agency that kind of helps the, run the courts, said that you guys needed four to six more judges to handle your caseload. 10 years ago. And it wasn't just 10 years ago, it's been every year since then. Okay, fine. <laughs> it's been going on, but it's, nothing's happened. Why? Uh, that's a, a good question. Better asked to people uh, in Congress, the senators of the state of California and the Congress people in the Eastern District of California. We have the need. There is no one who questions it. I have presented before the United States Congress on this very issue, and there was nobody who disagreed with the need. They just have not acted. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing politics are part of the equation here. It's always part of the equation. <laughs> of course. Um, so, you know, you were talking earlier, uh, you said you had senior judges, you had magistrate judges, you've got visiting judges that come in and help on, on occasion. We do. Why isn't that a viable long-term solution? Because uh, the visiting judges have other cases of their own, and when it comes time for trial, it is no longer possible or viable to them to continue on with these cases. We've had more than, in the last three years, we've had more than a thousand cases handled by visiting judges, but it causes tremendous administrative uh, burdens on our clerk's office with no additional clerk help from uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah, so what about senior judges? Is it just a burnout with senior judges? I'm doing this for free. I'm not going to take on another 900 cases for free. Is, is, that a, is it a burnout issue? It's, it's a burnout issue. It certainly is not a financial one. If it were a financial one, they wouldn't go senior at all. Yeah. Uh, so it's just a matter of by the time that they uh, are eligible to go senior status, they're worn out. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. So you said, listen, we're on a short fuse here um, because you've got a number of people that are going to be retiring um, shortly. You're down to six. Uh, We've got a third. A third of our district judges are retiring in the next 14 months. Yeah. So um, you're talking about catastrophic consequences if more district judges aren't assigned to the Eastern District. How, exactly. So wh wh how is this going to play out for the general, general public? It appears as though, uh, based on the additional United States attorneys that are being uh, hired uh, to prosecute criminal cases, coupled with the fact that the United States Constitution provides that criminal cases take precedence over civil cases, that it is very unlikely, unless we have additional judges 
and the replacement of the two that are retiring in 14 months uh, in a very timely fashion that we will not be able to handle any civil cases commencing February 1 of 2020 in 14 months. Any civil cases? Any. Wow. Um, so you got the, the criminal division, the, the district, U.S. attorney, they're ramping up. I don't want to say you're ramping down, but the judges, fewer judges, so this is a, a, a bad combination. It's a, it's a catastrophic combination, and that is what's changed. Uh, the uh, judges have accommodated uh, the, the problem for the last 10 years, for the last decade or more, but by working just harder and harder and harder, but it's not possible not anymore. anymore. Okay, well up next we're going to talk about some of those, talk to some of those practicing attorneys about what they think about the dwindling number of judges to hear their cases. That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. I'm Mark Kepler with the Maddie Institute. So what will the shortage of judges mean for those who litigate cases in front of the California Federal District Court? We're going to ask, first of all, what happens in criminal cases with McGregor Scott, the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of California. Welcome. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate so it. So the Chief Judge uh, noted, uh, noted in his uh, discussion that your office has announced you're going to have 12 new prosecutors. Why so many? Two things. Number one, the Department of Justice received its best budget in literally decades in this last go around on the budget. So it's a matter of now having the money to fill all the positions that were authorized because historically the offices run about a 10% vacancy. And combined with that, we've received four new lawyer positions, three of which are devoted to violent crime here in the Eastern District, two of which will be based here in Fresno. So it sounds like there are big problems here. So I assume that means you're gearing up for a lot of criminal prosecutions. Um, what impact will this lack of judges, of, of federal district judges, have on those cases? It's going to have a significant impact. We are up uh, well over 20 percent fiscal year 16 to 17 and another 20 plus percent 17 to 18 in the, in the number of criminal cases brought here in the Eastern mm -hmm. District. A classic example of the problem is that in the spring of 18, judges in Sacramento were setting criminal trials in 2019. Wow. So eight, nine, ten months out from the trial setting, which is just, you know, justice delayed is justice denied. Right. And that doesn't work for anybody under any set of circumstances. A, uh, the other problem we have, by way of example, here in Fresno, approximately six weeks ago, we had six criminal cases set for trial this week, all confirmed for trial with two judges. That doesn't work. Yeah. So some, a, some cases are getting moved. Well, some things are getting moved around, but the bottom line is that neither the United States government nor the criminal defendants, for the most part, are getting their right to a speedy trial. And that's a big deal. Well, up next, we're going to talk about civil cases. We recently talked to two experienced civil litigators, Richard Waters with Miles Sears and Yanni, and Daniel Jameson with Dowling Aaron, about the impact on civil cases. Well, Rick, welcome. Um, you know, we're talking about too few judges, and I assume their priority is going to be given to hearing criminal cases over civil cases. So my question is, isn't that going to make the situation even worse for civil cases that you handle? Well, the priority has always been criminal cases first. Um, in the Eastern District, it's been difficult the entire time I've been a lawyer in terms of getting cases out there. And back in the 80s, uh, there were cases where you'd have a trial date set, and the judge would summarily just go ahead and take your case off calendar and pick a new date some other, other place. But it's gotten worse. And, and now you go ahead and you file a case, and we have one that we filed in the Eastern District in Sacramento, and it's been pending for three years, and we do not have a trial date. And we have another one in Sacramento that's been pending over two years, and it finally got, has a trial date, but we could easily get to the trial date and not have a judge. Would you say it's gotten exponentially worse? It, oh, it's, it's worse than it's ever been. And so you file in federal court if you have a federal question, if the U.S. of A is a defendant or there's a federal question, or if you have diversity of citizenship. And on diversity cases, the defense can go ahead and remove you and have you go to federal court. They can have you go there if they want. So if you file there, you're, you're waiting a long, long time, and then you don't have any assurance that you will get a trial date. So, Dan, what does it mean for your clients in handling civil cases? Are we, this is justice denied? Well, let me give you some examples. Say you're a business and your business burns down. Your insurance company is an out-of-state company. They claim that you misrepresented whether you had fire extinguishers in your uh, plant or facility. So, they sue you in federal court as an out-of-state citizen entitled to sue a local resident. You desperately need that insurance money and need to get the issue resolved. You can quickly prove that you had the fire insurance, uh, fire extinguishers, and could... It sounds like it's going to take you three years or something. Well, that, that, under the problems that we're now facing in approximately a year, 
that case will not move at all. So the insurance company will sit there and they won't have to pay and you may end up going bankrupt. Take another example. Say you're a farmer that's upstream and you're a downstream farmer who uh, is a neighbor of that farmer. Federal law may impact and cover the rights of the parties relative to that water. If the upstream farmer takes water that the downstream farmer objects to and it's harming that farmer's crops or livestock, well, then he wants to sue in federal court to get a and determination of this, yeah. but it won't move. So what do these people do? They end up potentially showing up in a Hatfield-McCoy type situation where justice is taken to, in that case, it would be potentially the fields or well, the house, but justice is taken to the streets if the courts aren't open. And that's the real problem that we're facing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a serious problem. But one of the things we're going to look at next is the hyperpartisan nature of the confirmation process. Is that causing uh, a backlog? Is there any hope of toning things down and maybe addressing some of these, this growing shortage of district court judges? We're going to have that conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. I'm Mark Kepler with the Maddie Institute, and we're talking with Judge Lawrence O'Neill, the chief U.S. district judge for the Eastern District of California who has mentioned that if this problem of, of lack of judges, the shortage of judges, isn't addressed soon, we may have a situation where the federal courts are really going to be unavailable to a lot of people who live in most of California. So what is the solution? Is there a short-term fix here? There really is no longer a short-term fix. We thought there was for a while. We thought that it was only going to be a short-term problem. Therefore, a short-term fix would work. Have, has not happened. This is a long-term problem that needs a long-term fix, and the only fix is more judges. Now, it's been going on for 10 years, so it's, it's, it's getting a little long in the tooth. Well, let me ask you this. You know, if Congress does act on your request, um, it's bound to be politicized, I mean, particularly since the Democrats are still pretty upset about the Republicans deep-sixing Merrick Garland for, for the Supreme Court. Of course, Republicans would argue, hey, wait a second, they did that to Robert Bork. Um, the bottom line is that it seems like the judicial selection process has become highly politicized. Is there anything that can be done um, to make this process less political? Truly, the process has always been political. It's just set up that way in the United States Constitution that the sitting president, who is obviously elected from a political standpoint, does the nomination. The United States senators do the confirmation, and they're all uh, politically appointed or uh, elected as well. So it is a political process. The problem occurs when the people involved in the process uh, stop and stop talking with one another and stop negotiating with one well, another. Well, you've gone back to Washington. And you've asked them, say, "Hey, this is our problem. We need more judges." And apparently, no effect. I mean. Uh, do they talk to you afterwards and say, hey, we understand your concern, we just can't do it? I had one talk to me. A senator talked to me right after I, tes I testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee. And uh, his position was, we don't want the president of the opposite party to appoint. Well, that's always going to be true. Yeah. That, that is never going to change. What needs to change is the attitude and a respect for the Constitution. Because the Constitution does provide that the sitting president has that power. We simply need the resources. It's Congress's duty to provide the resources needed, and it's the, it's the president's duty to nominate. And so it sounds like some of this is Congress is shirking its responsibility in some respect, but it's also you can maybe talk about folks. And are, they, are we just too litigious? Um, there's too many cases being filed. Maybe that's the problem? Well, we have everybody who knows where the courthouse is, whether it be state or federal. Uh, and in some way, in some cases, absolutely, you look at a case and you think, this is going nowhere and it will last for a while through motions and that's time consuming, but it goes nowhere, just exactly how you saw mm -hmm. it at the beginning. But there's no way around that. The, the law allows that and uh, the law requires judges to pay attention to the cases and uh, see them through. Yeah, uh, you basically have a right to, to bring a case if you want to bring a case, generally. and, and that's right. You, you, that's all it takes is a complaint and a uh, filing fee, and you're in. Oh, and also the issue of habeas corpus and, and some people who are in jail filing, filing complaints. I assume that that's a big part of your, your docket? Well, uh, not just uh, usually the habeas cases are in, from the prison after they've been sentenced, right. 
and the uh, civil rights cases, uh, we have a lot of prisons in the Eastern District of California, right. and we have a lot of civil rights complaints. Well, that's actually a very unique part of the Eastern District, right? You've got a lot of prisons here. Yes, and we have a lot of cases from the prisons. Yeah. Um, so what about technology? Is that the answer? Be just to be more efficient through the use of technology? We've already done that. We, we, we're a paperless uh, court. It's all computerized. And uh, in some ways, uh, that has sped up the process of getting the cases to us. But it doesn't speed us up. Yeah. We, we still have to read, research, and decide. Well, let me ask you another question. You know, a lot of times, you know, clerks out of, you know, students out of law school yes. and clerk for, for, for a federal judge. What about hiring more full-time lawyers to do the, that kind of work? I have five working for me now, just for me. And I don't have time for a sixth. And what I mean by that... Because it's still going in the same funnel. It's still ending it, it up is. funneling you, to you. You're suggesting that the funnel at the top get wider, right. but that hole at the bottom is me. Right. And there, it doesn't get any bigger or uh, more expansive or create more time for me. Right. That's, that's a good answer. Um, so let me ask you this. What about alternatives to litigation? You hear about mediation <coughs> or fact-finding or arbitration. Is there a way to get some of these cases you know, out of the courts? Well, the magistrate judges have done a great job in that regard. Uh, they actually even now go out to the prisons. They don't just wait for lawyers and parties to come in for settlement conferences. They go out to the prisons where many of them are representing themselves and they're not free to come into the court for settlement conferences. Uh, but as far as mediation and arbitration, most contracts frankly have arbitration clauses and uh, they're required to go there at least first. Uh, sometimes it's binding arbitration and it, it uh, circumvents the courts altogether. But all of those things are going on now. Yeah. So and have been for quite some time. It's just we've got you've to have at, more judges. You've looked over under all these other possibilities, and it really comes down to just a simple fact. You just need more judges. No question about it. Okay. Well, I want to thank uh, the judge for being with us today and our other guests as well. If you want to stay up on state and local politics, you can log on to our website at maddieinstitute.org or check us out on Facebook and Twitter. This is Mark Kepler for The Matty Report. Thanks for joining us. The views expressed in the Maddie Report are those of the individuals participating in the program and do not necessarily reflect those of the California Channel or the Maddie Institute. If you'd like to share your thoughts about the points and opinions expressed on the Maddie Report, visit our website at maddieinstitute.org.